Good morning. It's great to be with you for morning devotions on this Monday. Today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 6, and uh, we're only going to do verses 1 through 8 today. Um, Pastor Nundorf took off, you know, like some big chunks of uh, of chapters of Genesis the last couple days, and uh, I'm going to slow it down just a little bit and uh, and do the kind of the bridge information that exists between what Pastor Nundorf talked about on Saturday which was uh, the, the generations of, of um, the line of people that came after Adam and Eve and, uh, and right before the time of the flood, which uh, we'll get to tomorrow. But today we get to see uh, Genesis chapter 6, where um, we see what happened in the world and also what God was doing in the midst of that. So we're going to start by singing um, hymn number 861. Because uh, the theme of uh, of the devotion today kind of carries over from Saturday too a little bit in uh, in thinking about the home and the family and how uh, how God is leading and guiding even in the midst of craziness around us. So we're going to sing "Christ Be My Leader." This is number eight hundred sixty one. Uh, please join me as we sing. Christ be my leader by night as by day. Safe through the darkness, for he is the way. Gladly I follow, my future is care. Darkness is daylight when Jesus is there. Christ be my teacher in age as in youth. Drifting or doubting, for he is the truth. Grant me to trust him, though shifting as sand. Doubt cannot daunt me, in Jesus I stand. Christ be my Savior, in calm as in strife. Death cannot hold me, for he is the life. Nor darkness, nor doubting, nor sin and its stain can touch my salvation with Jesus I reign. So from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the earth, of the land and daughters were born to, to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives as they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So there's uh, there's a bunch going on here, um, w which uh, includes some like obscure ideas, uh, obscure things from uh, from the book of Genesis. That uh, just going to give some kind of quick, easy, um, uh, interpretive understandings of uh, of some of these things. So who are the who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men? The best understanding uh, is that the sons of God are people who followed God. They, uh, they were um, part of the descendants of Adam and Eve and, and listened to God and were faithful to him and worshiped him. But then there were also others who had turned away from God and, uh, and, and started um, living 
uh, apart from uh, his word and will. And these are referred to as the daughters of men. So it's the this this joining together of of uh, a a marriage where um, where there's no longer worship of Yahweh in that in that family, and this continues to happen. We see here in uh, as as the population gets larger, and people turn away from God. And families turn away from God, and the generations turn away from God, and so that's what's happening here, and uh, and God is grieved by that. And then there's this group of people also called the Nephilim on the earth, and um, this idea of the they're mighty men of old, men of renown. Likely these were the uh, the kings and the rulers who had authority and might and power in the time of the ancient world too. And, uh, and they also, we get from this, turned away from God and, and didn't follow him. And so there were fewer and fewer and fewer who listened to God's word. And we get that understanding and the judgment that God's giving here, where uh, he saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So, um, in the midst of this, I mean, it just sounds like, wow, what a, what a horrible section of scripture, right? This is, um, where the world was so bad that there were, uh, everybody had turned away from God. And, uh, and this is part of the, the first and major sin, likely the sin of pride, the sin of saying, I don't need who God is, I can do these things in myself. He's given me this world. I can make my way on my own. I don't need to follow him. This likely happens at an even greater pace after Adam dies, right? Adam would, would have been around for quite a long time and uh, and people would have known of uh, of his account of who God was and what he had done. Still, people are turning away at this point. They knew Adam, and the, the oldest guy, the, and the first man, and they still started turning away from God. And so, um, and and it's, it's that sinful pride that does this, right? That where we take the things of, of the creation and we, uh, and we start to uh, rely on that instead of God himself. And, and so God says, um, the, uh, the, the years of man will be, uh, his days shall be 120 years. And, um, and often um, this, uh, this can get confused with the understanding that um, like we only live to 100 year, 120 years long. And, and there's, uh, you know, like, I think the oldest woman in like the modern age that lived is like 123. So it's, it's right around there. But, uh, but really God's saying 120 more years and then destruction of the earth will come. So there's three people that are part of this, uh, this lineage of family that are left up at this point. There's uh, Methuselah, there's Lamech, and there's Noah. And so they get to be the ones that receive this message, Noah and his father and his grandfather, that God's going to um, destroy this creation that he has made. And so what is their response? Well, well first of all, it sounds like a long time, right? 120 years, you know, we got lots of time to, to figure this out. But when they see the corruption of the world around them, they probably thought, well, it can't come soon enough. God, how are you going to work in the midst of this world when there's only a few of us left? Um, but they are years of God's mercy before his judgment. As he says to the world, this is what's going to happen. And so many reject that word as it comes through Lamech and Methuselah and Noah they, I'm sure, were, <laughs> were people going out and saying, you know, you need to listen this, to, their, to their neighbors, to their other extended family members, but no one else would follow. And so I'm, I'm sure that these guys, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, were filled with grief by seeing what God would do and, um, and the apathy of everyone else. 
I'm filled with grief when I see the apathy of other people. When we talk about who God is and what he has done and his son, Jesus Christ, and they say, yeah, that's cool for you, but I'm going to do my thing instead. Um, and so uh, Noah heard this word and he likely would have been filled with grief and said, oh, well, I've got 120 years left and this is all my life is. And uh, and we get this uh, this great verse, verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And that understanding that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord is not that Noah was great. He was a really good guy. And, and Lord's like, okay, well, at least I've got Noah. No, it's the Lord showed Noah favor. And he called him then to be the one to carry on the entire population of the world. Because uh, Noah understood that God is going to use him to fulfill his promises, right? He had made these promises to Adam and Eve that he would send a savior to rescue the world. And if God wipes out everyone, then God's not true to his promises. Noah believed that God would be true to his promises, that he would preserve him and this would lead forward. Now, the problem was when God made this pronouncement in uh, that 120 years were left, Noah wasn't married. He, uh, he wouldn't be married until 20 years later. And then Noah had uh, children <laughs> after he was married. So in the midst of knowing this world would be destroyed, Noah brought children into this horrible, corrupt world. And, uh, and that's an act of faith. I think it's still an act of faith today when Christians bring children into the world that we know that is evil and um, full of our own sin. Uh, we as parents have our own problems and sinfulness ourselves, and we uh, do our best to raise children in, uh, in God's word in the midst of it. Why did Noah do that? He knew that God would keep his promises through this family and carry on the generations and bring about this promised Messiah that would come. Why do we have children in the midst of this world? We do it because we know that God is carrying on his promises through them as well. And our role as Christians is to proclaim back to Christ and what he has done. And so we carry on to the next generation and they get to proclaim to the world what Christ has done. No one his family proclaim to the world what, what God would do. They all rejected him other than the woman that Noah found as his wife and the three women that Shem, Ham, and Japheth found as their wives. They followed and they listened and they knew that God would carry on with his promises. That's the point of, of, uh, of our Devo today. Because God promised then they had faith. And that's what we do today. Because God promises certain things, we have faith in him. And we can have faith in him because he has kept earlier promises, like we see what he did with Noah here. We see what he did with bringing a savior. We have faith in those promises today, that he has brought Jesus for us, and Jesus is coming again. And we teach our children this same truth, so that they would also be able to raise up the generation that follows them until Jesus returns, so that they're ready for that day. For Noah, he knew how many days it would be, and he could proclaim that. We don't know how many days. That almost makes the, the message more difficult to say. Someday Jesus is returning. For many, that's hard. Maybe not any more hard than 120 years. Yeah, right. God is remaining faithful to his promises. So we proclaim that truth that others may know too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you give us your promises and your truth and your word and you tell us, I am coming soon, Jesus says. And soon doesn't seem like it's soon enough in the midst of this corrupt and broken world and all the sinfulness that we see around it. And yet you use us along the way like you used Noah during those 120 years. You used his father Lamech and Methuselah up until the time of the flood to proclaim with him and prepare the way for Noah's family to carry on to the next generation. God, use us in this same way as we teach 
our children and our grandchildren the truth of your word that they may know. You are the Lord. We trust in your promises as a family from generation to generation. Preserve us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.